this led to a stop when the packed snow in front of my house in the Christian cruiser and blast the horn, which plays a sort of sick tuba rendition of the old rugged cross, then jumps out and starts up our ice-covered sidewalk. He nearly falls on his butt twice and calls to my mother to come skate couples with him. Mom opens the kitchen window to tell him to get that monstrosity away from her house before she calls a local Christian terrorist group. But Ellery only smiles and says, Hi, Mrs. Moby, and drops dramatically to his hands and knees to crawl safely to the kitchen door. The cruiser would be a true eyesore even in a nation of atheists. It's a pale blue 1973 Pontiac stational wagon with airbrushed clouds billowing from the hood to tailgate. Old black old English script stretching from the front to the rear fender announces the wages of sin is a buck fifty. A mighty fortress is our dog. In identical script screams at innocent bystanders from the driver's side, a testament to Ellerby's lifelong commitment to his family's Rottweiler Dick. He sometimes threatens to give the dog to me just so it could be called Moby's Dick. And if you happen to be chasing LRB down in a police helicopter, a not altogether unfathomable possibility, you will be treated to Oral Roberts takes aspirin, an old Rodney Dangerfield line from the days when Oral healed all comers over Sunday morning television. LRB is a dedicated student of the history of Christian broadcasting. His car has been the target of more vandalism than the Berlin Wall in the two years since he unveiled it, but Steve is an excellent body and fender man, and he just drags it down to his uncle's shop, pounds out the dents, and repaints it. It looks brand new. LRB whisks past my mother, standing over the kitchen sink, patting her lightly on the butt. She has long since quit threatening to send his teeth home in a paper bag for that. Call me a throwback, he says, a wistful glint in his eye. But when I see a teenage butt on a 36-year-old woman, well, I just have to attend to it. In my room, he pops onto a chair next to my bed, where I lie staring straight up at the insides of my eyelids, listening to the birds full blast on my headphones from a CD player mounted on my headboard. Mom keeps me supplied with the finest in musical or electronic hardware, as long as I agree to buy one CD of songs recorded between the years 1956 and 1975 for every contemporary one. Between... I'm hooked and I don't even know what's on MTV anymore because I'm busy with Bob Dylan and Buddy Holly and the Birds and the Rolling Stones and the Dave Clark Five and Turtles who are neither mutant nor ninja. So I'm lying here lost in a world in which for every season, for everything there is a season, and Ellerby's hand on my foot almost launches me clear through winter. He picks the best of Buddy Holly from the pile. Half these people are dead. I look at my watch. Jesus, is it time already? Past time, he says. Our scales are cracking and peeling. Yesterday's meet with South Central was the only one on this week's schedule, so we have a free Saturday. When that happens, Lemery puts it to us to be sure we don't peak too early in the season. She wants every kid at his or her fastest when it counts. For regionals and state, everything else is practice. Today's workout is to be particularly dreaded because there is an asterisk beside it on the bulletin board, tabbing it as special. Which, in real terms, means torturous. Special means how much can you take, and is freshly dredged from the very bottom of the barrel of Lemry's fiendish mind. Today's will be a hundred, count them, a hundred timed one hundred yard swims, starting at two minute intervals. If you make it in a minute, you have a minute to rest. If you make it in a minute 59 seconds, you have a second to rest. But that ain't all. To remain in the workout, you must hit your time standard or faster, which is figured at 10 to 15 seconds slower than your best time in a meet, depending on who you are and what you swim. Miss your standard? Swim no more. Also, every 1500 is a butterfly. And like Walter Dupree in a book called Stoughton, my idea of hell is swimming butterfly down a one-lane pool into infinity.
A sane person would miss his time standard after about 20 and call it a day, but no true swimmer fits that description even loosely. There's something about shared pain that keeps you going when you might back off on your own. And I would cram my tongue into a beehive and wiggle it wildly before letting her hear this. But when somebody puts as much into us as Lemry does, I'd die before winking out on her. That goes for most of the rest of the team, too. Ellerby and I whipped the cruiser through the snowy back streets of Spokane, Mahalia Jackson wailing the Lord's Prayer through the speaker mounted on the roof. I crouch low in the seat, my stocking cap pulled low in hopes I won't be arrested as an accomplice to dis desanctifying the word of God. The cruiser has caused a bit of a crack in the solidarity of our team, maybe even a chasm. Make that an abyss. Last year, Mark Britton, who has brothers named Matthew, Luke, and John, and a sister named Mary, need I say more, beseeched Lemmy to prohibit Ellerby from driving it to meets, including those at our own school, and to put a major squelch on his sacrilegious antics whenever he in any way representing the school or team. Lemmy told Mark to read the U.S. Constitution. Instead, Mark logged 50 more hours watching the Trinity Network, then took his complaint to the administration with a petition signed by 25 or 30 of his faithful followers, requesting not only that L.A.B. be banned from representing the school in his loathsome powder blue monstrosity, but that it also be outlawed in the student parking lot now and forevermore, world without end, amen. Britain had a friend in high places because Mott's is the vice principal here at MacArthur now. And Ellerby is about an ear here above me and Sarah Burns on his list of primary candidates for live organ donors. Luckily, for all us backers of Western democracy, Mr. Patterson, our principal, is a man of justice and vision and knows, though he would never say it, that Mott's is a wart on the butt of humanity. Anyway, Patterson keeps Mott's from turning MacArthur into a prison camp. And that means the Christian cruiser rolls on past the scorn of Mark Britton and his disciples. I should probably also mention that Ellerby's dad is a preacher. He's the white, stiff, round collar man at St. Mark's Episcopal Church, where Ellerby wears a robe and lights the candles every week. And they call me an enigma. My best hundred freestyle, a freak performance, actually, took me a little under 52 seconds to complete, so my time standard is 102. Lemery's kind and rounds her numbers up. I'm best at long distances, the 500 and 1650 freestyles, so time standards are probably easier for me to hit. Ellerby is a flyer, so so much a flyer that his best 100 fly time is almost the same as his best 100 free which is the fastest on the team. That gives him an advantage over me in this workout because the fly requirement every 1500 makes me consider suicide while he recharges, while it recharges him. I may have said there's something seriously wrong with Ellerby. The time span on this workout is more than three hours, but probably only five or six of us will go the distance. When someone misses a standard, they remain and cheer the others on. And afterward, Lemery will provide pizza delivered hot and fresh from Pizza Maria's and several billion gallons of Coca-Cola. We have 10 boys and 10 girls on the team, so it's a nice little party, but there is very little chance of it getting too intimate after that kind of workout. In my own case, I should say, to keep the record straight, Las Vegas bookmakers get migraine headaches even considering the odds. You up for this? Mark Britton leads the circle pattern in the lane next to mine. A tribute to Lemery's genius, either of us would willingly belly flop from the three meter board on two punji sticks dipped in dead animal rock before letting the other outlast us. Britton can out sprint me any day at 100 or 200 yards, but repeat time standards are my game. He might touch ahead of me on the first 20, 
but he can't afford to beat me by far, or he'll waste himself for the stretch. We are about equal in the butterfly, so he has no advantage there, and though there is really no doubt he's a more talented swimmer, he doesn't have the guts of a man with eight years of verbal abuse from Sarah Burns. I have those guts. Yeah, I'm up for this, I say back. How about you? Don't know. Been worn down a little lately. I'll give it my best shot. It's a cheap attempt at a psych job. Get me thinking he's barely holding on at first, and then come after me. Even though the real competition is against the clock, it's hard to ignore the guy in the next lane when he's Mark Britton. Sorry, Mark. This is a hundred hundreds. I own you. Ours is a regulation six-lane, 25-yard pool. Ellaby, Britton, and I lead circle patterns in adjacent lanes so we can see each other, another stroke of Lemery's genius, which seems to keep up our competitive juices flowing. My group and Britton's have four swimmers each, and Ellaby's is, and the rest have three. Fastest swimmer goes first, with the others leaving at three-second intervals, swimming on the right, just like on the highway. Pass down the middle, and if you catch the person in front of you on one repeat, you go first on the next. The shrill blast of Lemery's whistle ricochets around the high walls, and the swimmers in Britain's lane each drop to one knee, clasp hands, and bow their heads. Britain leads them in a quick prayer, asking God to let each do his or her best. On the far side, Ellaby drops to both knees, throwing his head back as he stretches his arms wide and loudly begs Jesus to come and swim the laps for him. When there's no answer, he opens one eye to a squint and asks if John the Baptist is home. Damn, he says in the face of no response. It's old stuff, and written squad doesn't react. Lemery sighs and shakes her head. Any conflict will keep us going. She knows we need every bit of love and hate we can muster to get through this. The first ten repeats go down easy for everyone. At fifteen, the first of six flies, we get a hint of how this will end. Seven people drop out after forty-five. The third fly, six of them boys. The girls would gloat, but by now the idea of using even one calorie for oral communication is unthinkable. At sixty, we lose two girls. At sixty-one, when the first of Britain's group succumbs, Elby breaks the code of silence to ask Britain's lord why he has forsaken them. But after that, the only sound to be heard are the constant churning of the water interrupted by the slap of feet and calves on each flip turn. The shrill blast of Lemmy's whistle and the urgent whine of eleven wheezing, oxygen-deprived idiots sucking every last molecule of breathable air out of the chlorine-filled atmosphere. At eighty-five, seven of us remain, and I'm holding less than a half-second under my time standard cursing myself for my one miraculous 100-yard freestyle during the second meet of the year, which was within two-tenths of Britain's best, giving us both the same standard. I'm touching ahead of him now. Have been since about 35, but not by much. I feel at a disadvantage setting the pace because he knows I won't miss. That means I have to think and swim when all he has to do is swim. Mostly, I'm just looking for reasons to hate him, because he's such a pompous turd. And the power of that particular emotion will get me through this. At 90, we swim our last fly. There's no time standard on the flies, but butterfly is butterfly, and at this point, a slow one is just as hard as a fast one. And the important thing is the recovery time between repeats. Britton and I finish in a dead heat at about a minute, 40. Ellerby beats us by an easy 10 seconds, and for the first time I think I might not be there for the final 10. 20 seconds rest just might not do it. Ellerby gives me the high sign. He's alone in his lane by now, indicating he'll set the pace for this one. If I can hit the next two, I'll recover. We hit the water on the whistle, and the surge of power I normally feel through the first lap is absent. I see Ellaby coming out of the turn a half body length ahead of me, and I know I have to pick it up on two and three to have a chance. Britton is hanging with me, 
continuing to let me work the strategy, so if I miss, at least he won't have done any worse than I did. That pisses me off. And I have a good second lap and feel a little power gathering when I flip into number three. At the end of three, I'm out of gas and running on the simple knowledge that if I give it up to pain and go all out, I'll have a minute to catch up. And I grip my teeth and sprint for the finish, touching a tenth of a second under my standard in a dead heat with Britain. Ellerby is a half body length ahead. Nine more. 92 is a carbon copy of 91. And now I know I'll make it. Only three boys remain, four girls. The rest of the team is revived sufficiently to urge us on loudly, chanting our names on starts and finishes. Before the whistle on 95, I look past Britain to Ellerby and nod, raising my eyebrows. Ellerby nods back. We're greedy. We want to make it. Want Britain to fold. Ellerby holds up two fingers. The number of seconds we're going to take this one under the standard. And I nod. If we can pull it off, Britain won't know what hit him. He expects us to cut the time standard by a razor's edge. When Lemery's whistle blasts, we hit the water and I reach to the bottom of my reserves for a strong first lap. Ellerby does the same, and of course Britain goes with us. Ellerby and I ring tenths of a second out on laps two and three, then kick all out on four. Britain goes with us. We finish a second and a half under our standard. Astonished realization passes over Mark's face when he sees the clock. He's not a distance man, and for him, the jig is up. I smile and gasp. Good swim. He misses 96 by a full second, and he's gone. Ellerby and I and two of the remaining girls finish the last three, and Pizza Maria is banging on the door. My Britain is pissed. The devil made us do it. The euphoria of our conquest drives me through the subsequent feeding frenzy in high gear, but within minutes of devouring my last slice whole, I begin to slip. Deep heat radiates from every muscle, and as that warmth consumes me, I could fall asleep on the bare deck but I still have to visit Sarah Burns, so I slap high fives all around and get LRB to shower with me and swing me home low in a sweet chariot. Guess we did a dance on Britain, LRB says, sitting behind the wheel. Guess so, I say back, sliding down in the seat. It's hard to resist. He's so damn righteous, such a dumb plastic god squatter. Sometimes I wish I could have religion their way, you know. No responsibilities in life but to cut down people who don't think the way you do. He waves a hand. <sighs> it's not worth talking about. But we burned him, didn't we? I knew we'd get him. He's such a leech he couldn't check his own body to figure out we were, what we were doing to him. He pounded the steering wheel. God, I love justice. He looks over at me. Going up to see your friend? I nod. You like her? It isn't a question. I nod again. He starts to say more, but doesn't, and we ride over the silent snow-covered streets to my house, chuckling every once in a while when one or the other of us pictures Britain's face the moment he realized he'd been duped. At home, I grab Bob's car to negotiate the icy streets across the South Hill to Sacred Heart, thinking of those days long ago when I held onto Sarah Burns like the only life raft in truly tempestuous, treacherous seas. She pushed her scars directly into our tormentors' faces while I disappeared into my cottage cheese carcass like a scared turtle in a soft shell, watching her wage our war of the outcasts alone. It's really hard to imagine how afraid I was then. How I pulled the covers over my head at night and prayed to hurry up and get older so I wouldn't care so much. It's also hard to imagine how I ate as much as I did. The population of the child and adolescent unit is down on weekends. There are no classes and no therapy groups going, and a few older kids sit reading while others quietly play games. Younger kids trail nurses and counselors like pull toys from spot to spot. Sarah Burns sits on the same spot on the same couch where I left her. Laurel isn't here, 
but a big young guy named Sam is taking her place. And he approaches as I sit making conversation with myself in hopes Sarah Burns will latch onto something she wants to talk about. He says, you must be Eric. I nod, shaking his extended hand. Anything different? Has she been on this couch since yesterday? Sam smiles and shakes his head. No, she sits in on um, all the activities. She just isn't talking, that's all. We know she hears and understands because she does whatever we're doing. Is she eating okay? Sam nods. Weed is good. She doesn't eat a lot, but then she's not burning a lot of energy. He squats beside us next to the couch. Was there an event that set this off? Not that I know of. She was sitting in American government class and just tripped out. When the bell rang, she didn't move. It couldn't have been a response to anything we were talking about because we were answering the questions at the end of the chapter. Sam nods then grimaces. Well, if you think of something or if you know anyone who might shed some light on this, let us know. I'm told you're her best friend. You should know, the more you come and talk, the better chance she has of coming out. Talk about old times, you know, familiar things. He pauses. What do you know about her father? I look sideways at Sarah Burns and say, I've known Sarah Burns since grade school, but she's only invited me to her house three times, and her dad was never home. He's mean, though, I'll tell you that. Mean, big time. I know for a fact he wouldn't let them repair her face when she first got burned. He seems awful proud of how tough she is. What does she say about him? I remember her threatening me with her fists when I tried to talk about her father in junior high. Not much. Sam scratches his head. That fits what we've seen. He's come up twice. Didn't stay more than ten minutes either time. Does she have any other close friends? Anyone who might know something about her or push her a little? Well, I say, there was this one guy back in junior high. His name's Dale Thornton. He was kind of a friend and kind of an enemy. He dropped out after eighth grade, though. Think he could help? Depends on how much of a friend and how much of an enemy he was. More friend than enemy, I say. At least, at the end. Old Dale was not having his best day. Though few of us would dare taunt him alone, there was safety in numbers, and he'd already heard his name far more times than he would have expected. Hey, Dale. I see you made the front page, greeted him as he stepped onto school property that morning, followed by several variations even before first period bell rang. At first, Dale just smiled and waved in the direction of the voice. By the third time he heard it, however, he had seen crispy pork rinds, and though he didn't read at all that well, understood clearly his role was the target of Sarah Burns's and my incisive journalistic focus. In the hallway, at the end of third period, Dale caught up with Norm Nickerson, a blonde, blue-eyed, bookwormish kid who spent our elementary years as the kid most likely to be beat up by someone from a lower grade. Dale clamped Norm's cheek hard between his thumb and forefinger. Norman, my boy, he said with a sneer, let's you and me go to the can for a smoke and maybe have a little talk. Norman mounted a weak protest, but Dale squeezed so hard Norman's lip began to numb. I was hiding out in a stall with my paranoia. My feet pulled up onto a toilet seat, waiting for the fourth period bell. In the event, Dale figured me for senior editor of our underground gazette and came for his pound of flesh. I peeked out the crack in the door, breathing soft as a man passing a township of killer bees in the night. Dale offered Norman the pack. Mm, no thanks, Norman said. I just had one. In fact, Norman Nickerson had never even puffed a cigarette, but at 83 pounds and well under five feet, he wasn't about to chance angering the man to whom most of us paid three quarters of our weekly allowance for protection from Dale Thornton. That's okay, Dale said. I only got one left anyway. 
Norman reached into his pocket, but Dale raised a hand. Got a deal for you, he said, and Norm was all ears. I'll let you go today. Norm waited. Dale glared. Still Norm waited. Still Dale glared. But that's not a deal, Norman offered finally. What do you get? Ah, oh, yeah, Dale said, waving a cigarette in the air. I almost forgot. He handed Norm a crumpled copy of Crispy Pork Rinds. Read this. Norm took the paper reluctantly. He glanced nervously at Dale, then down to the paper. He had thought it was pretty funny earlier in the morning. It was less funny now, with Dale Thornton looming over him. Norman shot Dale another uneasy glance and began to read silently. Dale slapped the side of his head so hard, Norman must have thought the phone rang. Out loud, you dip, he yelled. Read it out loud! By Norman realized Dale couldn't read well enough to get through the article. Holding his hot, leaden ear tenderly with his left hand, he opened his mouth to read. I'd read it myself, Dale said, but a man of my statue who hires his grunt work done. Read. I think Norman started to tell Dale that's stature, but thought better and adjusted his glasses. He began with the headline. I read that part, Dale warned. Just give me the small print. Norm skipped to the text, reading in his high, shaky voice. A man described by authorities as one evolutionary step above a banana slug has recently admitted to having been locked in the Sacagawea Junior High Biology Lab over a long weekend nearly 16 years ago when he fell asleep and was mistaken as a cadaver. Though the man is incapable of human speech, he was able, over a period of weeks, to chisel out his story in hieroglyphics on the bathroom wall of the insane asylum where he now resides. He claims that toward the end of the second day of his accidental captivity, he got downright lonely and sought companionship at his own intellectual level. He found that companionship in a petri dish. Norman glanced up at Dale. He had to be terrified because Dale was famous for confusing the message with a messenger. If that happened, Norman knew his nose would soon be pressing hard against the bottom of the toilet, where it is extremely hard to breathe. Keep reading, Dale said. That ain't all of it. I seen it. It's longer than that. Norman drew a deep breath. According to the man who identified himself as Morton Thornton, the night got real long and by midnight, he was darn well wed to one of the lovelier inhabitants of the dish, a comely middle-aged amoeba of unknown parentage named Rita. When he was rescued on the morning of the following day, Morton Plum forgot about his single-celled nuptials and went back to his daytime job tasting the contents of open pop bottles for backwash and cigarette butts. Only 16 years later, when a brilliant Sacagawea junior high roving reporter, who shall remain nameless, discovered the product of this union lurking among us right here at Sac Junior High. He was Morton's long-held secret discovered. This intrepid reporter was present three weeks into Dale Thornton's third try at seventh grade when, he, when the young Einstein bet this reporter and several other members of the class he could keep a wad of chewing tobacco in his mouth from the beginning of fifth period social studies until the bell. The dumb jerk only lasted 20 minutes, after which he sprinted from the room, not to be seen for the rest of the day. When he returned on the following morning, he told Mr. Getz he had suddenly become ill and had to go home, but without a written excuse. He probably didn't have a big rock, a big rock, rock big enough for his dad to chisel it on. He was sent to the office. The principal, whose intellectual capacities lie only fractions of an IQ point above Dale's, believed his lame story, and Dale was readmitted to class. Our dauntless reporter, however, smelled a larger story, recognizing that for a person to attempt this in the first place, even his genes would have to be dumber than dirt. With a zeal rivaled only by Alex Haley's relentless search for Kunta Kinte, he dived into Dale's seamy background where he discovered the above story to be absolutely true and correct. Further developments will appear in this newspaper as they unfold. 
Norman folded the paper slowly. I breathed through my pores in order not to be discovered. Is that it? Dale asked quietly. Norman raised his eyebrows. That's it, he squeaked. All their, their story says is I'm pretty dumb, don't it? Me and my dad, Dale said. Norman winced and nodded. Uh -huh, it's not necessarily true, though. I mean, it's not a real newspaper. I was there the day you did the tobacco. Really, it was pretty neat. Nobody else would have had the guts. How'd they know my old man's name was Morton? Dale said. Everybody calls my old man Butch. He finds out about this, he'll skin my hide, because he'll think I told. Norm was quiet. He lived with his family on a farm. He knew better than to mess with a wounded animal. How'd they know? Dale was insistent. I don't know, Norman squeaked. Really, I was there. The day with the tobacco, I mean. You better shut up, Dale warned, then paused a minute. Better give me your money, too. I thought you said. Yeah, well, you was wrong. You gonna give me the money, or you wanna go swimming? Dale nodded toward the toilet stall where I sat. Give him the money, Norman? Norman Nickerson dug deep. My fifth period, word was out that Dale Thornton was looking for Eric Calhoun and a high-stakes gambling pool had been set up in an inconspicuous corner of the student lounge. Bets were running three to one that I wouldn't make it home with all my body parts. Dale had been seen in the hard chair in the outer office before lunch bell, and rumor said he spent the entire lunch period in the office with Mott's discussing the relative merits of smokeless tobacco in the classroom. His only words upon release were, Where's that fat-ass Calhoun? He's a dead man. He'll have to go through me first, Sarah Burns said in an effort to get me out of my study hall desk. Oh, that'll take him all of about 15 seconds, I said. The only hurt you put on him in that fight was on his knuckles. God, I'm dead. I'm a dead man. I sat staring at the desk, considering. Get Ms. Simmons in here right now. She won a Nobel Prize if she gets me on video. I'm a biological miracle, a living dead man. A short, high-pitched laugh escaped me. <laughs> I could make the next issue of Crispy Pork Rinds. Oh, God, Crispy Pork Rinds. What a great idea. Come on, Sarah Burns said. It isn't that bad. Let's go to science class. He's not going to beat you up in the hall. Oh, yeah? What makes you think that? Because he'd get in trouble. Right. By who? Moths? Why should he care? He's already in trouble with Mott's. I bet Mott's told him who wrote the paper. That's it! I screamed, realizing the truth. See? This is like a big city gang war. The cops don't really care when one bunch of bad guys knocks off another bunch of bad guys. They're getting their job done for him. Mott's hates Dale Thornton, but he hates me, too. He wastes no bullets. I can see it now. He'll get to the scene right after I choke to death on my own blood. Call my mom and tell her how sorry he is. If I just could have gotten there quicker. I'm awful darn sorry, Mrs. Calhoun. Maybe you could have another kid. A better one. I don't see why. Eric, Sarah Burns said. Just calm down, will you? Teal Thornton isn't going to get you in the hall because he's never in the hall. He's out smoking somewhere. Now, let's go to science. We can plan your getaway. I slid out of my desk to follow Sarah Burns. What the heck did it matter where our dead man went? It's important that you get away, Sarah Burns said in the hall. I've got a lot of money riding on you. Two, a couple of things that uh, stand out. We're introduced to several new characters. Um, number one, we're introduced to Ms. Lemmering, and we get a sense of who she is and what she's like. She seems to be very much um, a, a supporting character and someone who is on uh, Moby's, Eric's side. So that's um, a really kind of neat thing to see. Um, she's also Eric's swim coach. So she's got a couple roles there. Um, we're introduced to um, Dale Thornton, and Dale Thornton is a pretty interesting character. In case you didn't catch it, he is uh, a 16-year-old in 8th grade. Now, for most 8th graders, they are 13, and so that means he would have been taking 8th grade four times in a row. 
Okay. Um, and the joke, in case you missed it, um, well, his life skills making um, license plates or paving the um, parking lot, those are the, the tasks of a person who's in jail. So he thinks that Dale's on his way to, to going to jail, um, and he's just kind of being sarcastic about it. Um, we also learn something about Sarah Burns in this flashback. We learn that she is a tough character and that she doesn't give in. She doesn't give in to pain, she doesn't give in to people, she doesn't give in to anything. She just refuses to show weakness. And you have to think that that is in response to her scarring and, and the sort of physical disfigurement that she's had. But she's very smart and she seems to have a real sort of connection to Eric. Um, when we get to the funny part, to me anyway, we see that um, they wrote crispy pork rinds because they were trying to get back at Dale Thornton. And so Sarah Burns, who took the beating of her life, okay, um, and Eric, who was nervous and scared because he thought he was going to get beaten up, they wrote crispy pork rinds, boom, to try to have some fun and get back at Dale Thornton for beating her up. Um, it's kind of interesting. Now, it's also interesting that them doing this um, makes Mr. Motts from Chapter 1 so angry as well. So it's something that you want to think about, sort of what is the connection then between uh, these different characters. We see that Mr. Motts is an antagonist. We see that uh, Dale Thornton is an antagonist. And then we see these other characters um, being introduced, um, So, uh, like Mrs. Lemery. So pay attention to it. Um, I think this is a pretty exciting book. Moving forward, a um, couple things you want to keep in mind. Uh, what happens next? I mean, they wrote this. How did Dale take it? Does he even understand it? I mean, he's in eighth grade for four years. Does that mean he's just too dumb to get that they're making fun of him? We'll find out. All right, guys.